from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. This is U.S. Farm Report. Welcome to U.S. Farm Report. This weekend, we're on the road from the 50th Annual Missouri Governor's Conference on Agriculture, and here's what's in store over the next 60 minutes. The garden spot for growing cotton this year. I haven't had a year in 28 years, 29 years maybe, now that I have seen uh, the good growing conditions as we had this year. $4 million to fuel the food and beverage industry across the Show Me State. We've got to figure out how to get more out of the existing footprint that Missouri already does a great job with. And so value added is a term that really means a lot. How one program is helping farmers and small businesses grow to new heights. A trip around the globe to the Super Bowl of Ag Equipment Shows. Advantages with electrification is I have high torque available at low RPM and it's instant. From dealing with chokes in the supply chain to now unlocking what's next. Our first time visiting Agra Technica and we're taking you along for the ride. U.S. Farm Report presented by Pioneer. What's next happens when experience meets expertise. Pioneer, what's next happens here. Now for the news, President Biden meeting this week with the leader of our biggest U.S. ag buyer, China. The two leaders meeting in Silicon Valley on the sidelines of the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation Forum in San Francisco. The last time President Biden spoke in person with Xi Jinping was a year ago in Bali. Mr. Biden saying ahead of the high stakes summit, he hoped Wednesday's meeting would put the U.S.-China relationship on steadier footing. White House officials said they didn't expect a long list of outcomes. Instead, the primary objective appeared to be restoring channels of communication. I value our conversation because I think it's paramount that you and I understand each other clearly, leader to leader, with no misconceptions or miscommunication. We have to ensure that competition does not veer into conflict. And we also have to manage it responsibly, that competition. That's what the United States wants and what we intend to do. Xi, speaking through a translator, said the relationship between China and the U.S. has never been smooth, but has kept moving forward, saying, quote, for two large countries like China and the United States, turning their back on each other is not an option, end quote. That meeting between the two sides apparently helped spur purchases of U.S. soybeans. China bought around 3 million metric ton of soybeans or 110 million bushels from the U.S. last week, a volume that reportedly surprised the market. They added another 7.5 million bushels on Monday. That's even though U.S. soybeans are more expensive than Brazilian supplies and processing margins are weak. The purchases were seen as a goodwill gesture ahead of Xi's meeting with President Biden. My mindset is their pork industry is in tough enough shape, their deflation is bad enough, their consumer is stalled out since the zero COVID policy, that they really don't need to buy extra. Um, what they're probably looking and fishing for is some cash injection, some foreign direct investment, because that has been pulled out dramatically from the Chinese economy, and it's really hurting them. And I think President Xi knows that. The head of world trading at Cargill, the world's largest agricultural commodities trader, indicates China is purchasing more than it needs for domestic use, signaling it's seeking to build stockpiles. But other sources indicate that Sinograin has a dual role of crushing beans and managing reserve stocks for the government. And Xi's visit is the only logical reason that they would pay a big premium over Brazil beans because crushers don't pay above market prices. A plan to avert a government shutdown and extend the current farm bill moved its way through Washington this week. New Republican Speaker Mike Johnson of Louisiana forced to reach across the aisle to Democrats when hard right conservatives came out against the plan. The measure includes an extension of the 2018 farm bill through September of next year. Democratic Representative Mark Pocan of Wisconsin supporting it, warning that without the farm bill extension, milk prices would have soared and hurt producers back in his home state. Johnson's proposal to temporarily fund the government into the new year passed on a bipartisan tally with 93 Republicans voting against it. I was very disappointed that last second he added the farm bill and actually punted till the next fiscal year, till October, because this is a very important bill where we need to look how we can improve competition in farmers, the health of Americans, how we can help smaller farmers, and also how we can have Americans healthier and have better food. So I think we need to think about things like that. And I was very disappointed that we decided to punt this issue. 
The legislation sets up two funding deadlines. Agriculture, along with the energy and water and others, would be funded through January 19th. The rest of the federal government would be funded until February 2nd. Well, Arkansas's Attorney General says Syngenta has paid a $280,000 fine to the state. Attorney General Tim Griffin says the fine was for failing to report in a timely matter Syngenta's ownership of a 160-acre research farm within the state. Griffin says next, Syngenta must divest itself of the land it has owned since 1988 in Craighead County. You'll remember that we told you about last week that state officials told Northrop King Seed Company it had two years to divest. It comes after the state legislature passed a law restricting certain foreign party controlled businesses from having private land in Arkansas. Northrop is a division of Syngenta Seeds, which is owned by Kim China, which is a Chinese state owned company. But the head of Syngenta North America has told Farm Journal that nothing illegal has taken place of the farm and they're still working on next steps. And if they're forced to sell, it would put Arkansas farmers at a disadvantage. The American Farm Bureau Federation is out with its annual survey of how much your Thanksgiving meal will cost. And it says overall prices are down from last year's record high. It says the classic holiday feast for 10 people averages $61.17 or less than $6.20 per person. That's 4.5% decrease from last year, but it's still 25% higher than it was in 2019 due to high supply costs and inflation. The centerpiece of the feast, the turkey, helped to bring down the overall cost with the average price for a 16 pound turkey coming in at just over $27 or 171 per pound. That's down 5.6% from last year. Meanwhile, pumpkin pie mix and dinner rolls are seeing the largest increase. That's it for the news. Just beautiful weather here in Missouri and much of the Midwest this week. But is that about to change? We'll have a check of your weather coming up next. Your next piece of equipment is on machinerypeat.com. Search equipment from dealerships across the country to find what you're looking for. Only on MachineRepeat.com. U.S. Farm Report weather is brought to you by H&S Manufacturing. The PS6180 Power Spread Live Bottom Vertical Beater Manure Spreader is the heaviest built spreader in its size. This manure spreader has a 793 cubic foot heaped capacity and includes three quarter inch grade 80 marine log chain and removable vertical beater assembly with three quarter inch flighting and replaceable blades. Find out more at the H&S website. Time now for a check of weather with meteorologist Matt Engelbrecht. Matt, Missouri was in the bullseye this summer for drought. 75% of the state is still showing up on the drought monitor. And with temps in the 70s this week, it definitely does not feel like Thanksgiving is just next week. But I hear that's about to change. Yeah, but things are going to flip. In fact, we're going to get back down into frozen turkey territory coming up just in time for Thanksgiving. Pocket of cold air coming through between November 21st and the 25th. Uh, in terms of precipitation, not a lot of moisture in the atmosphere during this time period. And the estimated rainfall, which that's what we're expecting you know, over the next seven days, uh, is set to mainly be back down here towards the south. If we were combining that moisture with that pocket of cold there, we would be talking about snow. But right now it's looking more like just cold air around the Midwest Wednesday, Thursday and Friday of next week. The precipitation outlook. So again, November 25th, 21st through the 25th, uh, the below average conditions into the Midwest, Illinois, Indiana, uh, back up into Wisconsin. And then once again on the West Coast as another ridge of high pressure tries to develop as well. Where you're seeing the green, that includes parts of Colorado. I expect that in the higher terrain, some snow in the higher terrain and then uh, rain back along the Gulf Coast states. Again, that's going through November 25th. Checking out what's going on with the jet stream this week. The big feature is that pocket of cold air in the jet stream. Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday starting to take shape and bottle it back up into Canada and then sweeping on through Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday with a good portion of the nation and be under the, uh, the grip of some of the colder air. Probably potentially the coldest of the season for some locations. Ridge starts to build back out here towards the west. That's going to keep things pretty quiet uh, for Thanksgiving uh, there in parts of California, Oregon. And then we'll start to talk more about this cold air moving out Friday and Saturday and uh, potentially some more warmer temperatures moving in next Saturday and Sunday of next week. We'll of course keep an eye on what's going on back up here towards the north because that's where the cold air breaks off and scoots down here to the south. Otherwise, more of a zonal flow going into the weekend, which should keep things relatively quiet. Quick check what's going on with that drought monitor. So you got uh, potential 
now for some rain in the Gulf Coast states. Unfortunately, most of that is going to be back to the east, still sitting in an extreme to exceptional drought into Louisiana, but also still a drought into Iowa. In Wisconsin, Minnesota, we've had some help, but I'm not expecting much Monday, Tuesday or Wednesday. Much relief uh, from this in regards to uh, breaking the drought or busting the drought. Still expecting it to stay pretty dry. Thanks, Matt. Well, the ramp up in exports. What's behind all these buys from China? Our marketing roundtables from right here at the Missouri Governor's Conference on Ag happens next. U.S. Farm Report on the road from the 50th Missouri Governor's Conference on Agriculture is brought to you by the Missouri Department of Agriculture, celebrating the determination and tenacity of Missouri's farmers and ranchers. Welcome back to U.S. Farm Report this weekend, the 50th Missouri Governor's Conference on Agriculture, and we're excited to be back. We have Scott Brown, Bill Brooks, as well as Carly esser McLean on the program with us this weekend. We have a lot to talk about with commodities, getting into some policy with Carly as well. All right, but let's look at the bigger picture right now. We've seen China come in and start some buying. We had a big meeting between President Biden as well as Xi Jinping. What is behind these buys now that we're seeing from China that's impacting corn and soybeans? Yeah, I think perhaps part of what we have going on, Tyne, is that when you look at that Brazilian crop, it uh, looks like we're gonna be down in corn acres in Brazil, a combination of weather, uh, as, as well as tighter margins, uh, I think is really going to affect planted acreage. So I think there's the Chinese saying, I'm going to need to look for some other markets so the U.S. may be a good alternative. Right now, though, I mean, we know the, the saying, um, you know, kind of when you look at the, the, the rumors and things that are going around, that sometimes it can be a little overdone. And if this is a supply-driven rally or demand-driven rally, that is what you have to keep in mind. So at this point, do you think it is truly a supply driven or demand driven rally? Well, I'm a good economist, so I always say both, but I think very much uh, the supply side, uh, as we look at South America is driving some of the short term decisions being made by the Chinese. We wanna be careful about getting overly excited about where we sit today. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure whether we meet the kind of export levels we would have seen in corn and soybeans last year when we think about what's gonna happen this year uh, with China. So I, th I think we're a little early in this process, but I think South America and the growing conditions and the amount of acreage that we're talking about on the soybean side time, we're, we're talking about what's 4% growth maybe in soybean acres that for the last three or four years has been six plus percent growth. So I, I think the Chinese are seeing what's happening and saying we need to look at some of the other markets and the U.S. is a good alternative. Well, some saying this week that this is a goodwill gesture ahead of the meeting between uh, Biden and Xi, that this is just a, a goodwill gesture with some of this buying. I mean, when you look at this meeting this week, did it actually change the relationship between the U.S. and China? If so, I think that remains the same. Just like Stott's mentioning, they're looking at what the weather conditions are, uh, the planting progress in South America, and they're attempting to cover potential needs. We have to remember that they're basically in April, May time frame as far as the growing season, so they still have a lot of opportunity to end up with a third to large crop. And in weather forecasts, some of these suggestions, they were kind of leaning towards a little bit of better weather than some of those growing regions. So if they, the Chinese, that is, start to see a good crop come in from Brazil or Argentina, they're probably going to cancel any orders that they have made here in the U.S. that have a thing better and move their business back to South America. Mexico's coming in as a much bigger player. We saw Mexico outpace China as our biggest um, importer of, of U.S. ag goods. Looking at the dairy side, is Mexico stepping up to the plate for dairy as well? They have been up until September, and then they kind of backed off just a little bit, but that still is a good natural market for us. So I would imagine it's probably just more of a short-term blip in that uh, reduction in exports during the month of September, and that they'll probably start to kick things back up. Well, Carly, as professional staff at the Senate Ag Committee, I know you have had a plate full as of late, but as we see the continuing resolution, move its way through Washington, a farm bill extension. Why is this something that the House and Senate Ag Committee leaders wanted? Why is it an extension versus a new farm bill? That's a good question. And I think this agreement for an extension on a bipartisan level shows that all four corners of the Senate Ag Committee can and have a proven track record of working well together. And Senator Bozeman, the ranking member, feels very strongly that we do need a farm bill and that we need one quickly. But this gives us a little bit more runway because at the end of the day, while we need a farm bill, we need the right farm bill. And we need a little bit more runway to get that policy finalized. And I know this is a true extension, so policies just stay the same. But we're hearing 
at things like reference price for corn and soybeans and wheat, we could possibly see an increase there. So what is it within that 2018 farm bill that could cause an increase in those reference prices for those crops? There is a provision in the 2018 farm bill called the reference price escalator. Um, and so it, but it escalates up and escalates down as well. So it's based on five-year Olympic average prices. So when prices are higher, we might see a bump in reference prices. Um, but if it is lower, then that escalator drops as well. Um, so it is not a staff story reference price increase. And that shows that we still need an investment in the safety net. All right. Well, we're just getting started with our marketing discussion. A lot to talk about with cattle uh, and a lot more to discuss here on U.S. Farm Report. But first, we need to take a quick break and then we'll be back with more U.S. Farm Report in just a moment. The collapse of crypto. Here's John Phipps. Over the past few years, I've had uh, five or six requests to explain cryptocurrency and blockchain. Okay, I read a couple of books, I listened to podcasts, and I plotted, plotted through countless articles. That was a waste of my time, at least. After significant effort, I just didn't get it. It reminded me of relativistic physics, which I barely survived in college. No matter how hard I tried, and despite some very cool graphics, it looked like financial sleight of hand to me. The collapse of cryptocurrency and the evaporation of billions of investor dollars and the hyper coverage of Sam Bankman Fried, the wunderkind of crypto and someone I'm really tired of seeing on my favorite news sites, seems to have proven me right. Not right in the sense that I knew it was a scam, but right in deciding this was something that I wouldn't live long enough to be affected by. You get that way at my age. Cryptocurrencies may still have a faint pulse, and because it seems to be something that would help financial institutions move money around faster or something, they may reemerge down the road. The massive washout of investor dollars, or wealth at least that we thought was there, will certainly make that recovery a long-term affair, I would guess. It has poisoned the well for the average consumer, and it may take another generation for the crypto collapse to stop being a punchline. The amount of wealth available for such dubious investments is almost beyond imagining. Real assets, like from land to uh, art, comprise about half of global wealth. Financial assets like stocks, bonds, and, and an array of more complex instruments make up the other half, or roughly $250 trillion. Farmers may never be as comfortable with a stock option compared to a section of land, but the rest of the world has no problem with abstract forms of wealth. Liquid wealth is available for all kinds of investments, and cryptocurrencies must have seemed like a reasonable idea to many. I am not gloating over losses caused by this financial fiasco, but I am reassured that my rule of, if you can't explain it, don't buy it, isn't totally inappropriate. Admitting your own ignorance, if nothing else, can be a time saver. Definitely some good food for thought there. Thanks, John. Well, when we come back, Tractor Tales with Machinery Pete. That is right after the break. Welcome back to Tractor Tales, folks. This week, we're off to Centerville, Ohio to check out a semi-retired John Deere LI that gets a workout every year in the largest pumpkin festival in the country. Ah, uh, this is uh, a John Deere LI. It belonged to a cousin of mine who uh, got it in uh, Phoenix, Arizona. It originally came from Pickaway Township here in uh, Pickaway County in Ohio. Chuck's dad uh, actually operated this tractor mowing roads in, in Pickaway Township. He found it and it was uh, out west. He got a hold of it. Uh, it was restored and he's had it in his possession for all these years. Chuck uh, decided he's getting older and he wanted to uh, give this tractor to me and my son Eric because he wanted someone that appreciated old iron and would take care of it 
It's been well appreciated by this family and it would probably continue to be so. A lot of uh, local growers, pumpkin growers, uh, now uh, compete to get the largest pumpkin. Then on Thursday night of the pumpkin show, they have a parade. My son, Eric Atwood, drove it uh, through the parade. Uh, it's important to me, it's part of my uh, history. I've always loved tractors, I loved old iron. It's got family roots back to my family. Up next, if the pandemic taught us one thing, it's the need for resiliency in the supply and the food chain. So how could $4 million fuel the food and beverage industry across the Show Me State? We'll have that answer next. Welcome back to U.S. Farm Report. Trusted, timely, tradition. Well, seeing the need to support farmers, small businesses, and the food and beverage industry as a whole, the Missouri legislature created something monumental that could help add value to businesses from the ground up here in the state. It all started in 2019 when Chris Chin, director of Missouri Agriculture and other ag industry leaders across the state had an idea. The whole purpose of these grants was to create opportunities to add value to Missouri agriculture. An idea to help grow food and beverage production across the state. They commissioned a survey and they went out in the market and they found out what Missouri was able to produce an additional product. Um, and really that was the basis that farmed the Missouri Food Forest Products Task Force that the governor was kind enough to ask me to chair. Missouri Lieutenant Governor Mike Kehoe says as he looked at the future of ag in the state, he knew they needed to get creative to help the industry grow. We're not making any more land. We don't intend to annex any states next to us. We've got to figure out how to get more out of the existing footprint that Missouri already does a great job with. The Missouri legislature and Missouri governor ended up approving more than $4 million for SEGA, which is the Show Me Entrepreneurial Grants for Agriculture program, all for startup and existing farm operations that needed additional help to be able to grow. By providing these grants to these folks, uh, we're giving them an opportunity that they might not have been able to get through the traditional means, and this really gives them a leg up to be able to increase production, hire more jobs, expand their footprint, and really grow our ag economy through the value added process. Chen says 28 grants were awarded in total to help add value to agriculture, but also to make room for the next generation to come back to the family farm or business. We had a lot of timber applications, we had wineries, we had meat processors, the sunflower, we even had some corn growers who applied. And so it was just really unique to see the entrepreneurial spirit that is alive and well in Missouri agriculture. As the committee championed the need to help support all types of operations and businesses, Chen says one great example is a family dairy located right along Interstate 70 in the state, Hemi Brothers Creamery. We gave them money that's going to help them expand that and make them be able to be able to use all of their milk to make their cheese now, where before they did not have the capability to use all of the milk they were producing. They were still having to sell some of it. So being able to keep all of that value on their family farm to add more value to it, it's a great success. From a distilling company putting in a bottling line for their bourbon made from the corn they grow, to Herzog Premium Beef adding new equipment to help expand meat processing and attract new customers, Kehoe says all 40 grants awarded will be a huge economic driver for the state. We think in general, now this is over a period of uh, several years, that there's $25 billion worth of room and growth in Missouri's ag economy. That's a 25% increase, a little bit more than that, than where we are right now. And he says the return on investment has the potential to be huge. Well, small business can spend money better than any government official can any day of the week. And when you take the resources that we have available at the state and you put it back in the hands of business owners, they know how to get a return on investment better than any bureaucrat ever will. We think that that expansion could add up to 70,000 jobs in our state's ag economy and produce over $3 million a year in additional payroll taxes. And if you look at that uh, investment that we're making and what the return could possibly be, it's uh, any business person would love to have that return on investment. As the SEGA grants help bring more value to small ag businesses across the state, Chin says it's unlocking a world of opportunities in the future. 
We're hoping that this money has allowed them to springboard forward to be able to get to that sweet spot where they can continue to grow their business because of the income generated from this grant. They're going to be able to continue to grow the business as they feel necessary. We're hoping that in five, ten years, these companies look back and they say the SEGA grant was the turning point in our family operation. You can view a complete list of the SEGA program winners and see some of the innovation happening here in Missouri by visiting the Missouri Department of Agriculture website. Well, cattle producers across the country are still coping with the impacts of drought. So what's starting to weigh on cattle prices? Our marketing discussion is next. U.S. Farm Report on the road from the 50th Missouri Governor's Conference on Agriculture is brought to you by the Missouri Department of Agriculture, celebrating the determination and tenacity of Missouri's farmers and ranchers. Welcome back to U.S. Farm Report this weekend. Well, I mentioned it earlier in the show, but here in Missouri, really in the bullseye of some of that drought this year, still seeing the impacts. We've had a little bit of rain, but when you look at hay supplies, I mean, there are a lot of concerns into rebuilding this, this cattle herd. We have seen some pressure as of late, though, on, on cattle prices. So what dynamics are at play right now, Scott, that have kind of changed that a little bit? Well, so, so I still think it's very positive from a cattle price perspective, okay. even though we have backed down in the last few weeks in terms of prices. Um, I, I think we might be seeing some signs of slowing demand in some cases that, that have been at play. Uh, but I'm still relatively optimistic when we look ahead that we're going to talk about cattle prices that could continue to be at record levels because we're not building the herd. All the data we have available to us, whether it's heifers that are on feed or beef cow slaughter, tells me beef cow numbers will be down January 1 of 24. Frankly, could be down January 1 of 25. At the same time, we are seeing some profit squeezes take place for the major packers. And so when you look at the interesting dynamic and how those tables have turned, what impact, what ripple effect could it have on the livestock industry that maybe we're not talking about right now, Scott? Well, so I think certainly we're going to see some packers that are going to struggle to survive through these very tight cattle supplies. And although we may not need that capacity today, uh, when we talk about rebuilding the herd, which I think does happen at some point, uh, that capacity will be much more needed. Uh, this, this idea of how do we cooperate with the different segments of the industry in, in a way that allows the industry to grow. We want to grow demand. Last thing we want is somewhere along the way to be a bottleneck that keeps us from growing demand for beef. The, the cattle industry has done so well at this, it has to continue, and that's coordination along the way of all marketing segments. Bill, on the latest supply and demand report from USDA, we did see them um, kind of in increase uh, the milk production and, and, and forecast, some of those price forecasts, but reduce its production forecast. So when you look at some of those changes, is there a geography that we're seeing milk production on the decline? It's still kind of scattered out throughout the country, but we are seeing a slowdown in some of the west of the states, especially Texas and Mexico. So New Mexico has been out of down on the trend. Uh, Ford it had been, they've kind of bounced back up a little bit. So it's really kind of scattered throughout. Midwest actually, especially the upper of the West, has been holding pretty decent. Uh, South Dakota's been one of our largest growing uh, states as far as milk production goes. Uh, and in the reduction that we've had, there at least in pound maps coming in, some people will double our count number because they're originally taking advantage of those iron cold cow prices to help offset the really, really tight margins that we had near the summertime. Just a month ago, we were talking about these impressive butter prices. And maybe this holiday demand was coming in a bit early. Now we've seen butter prices erode. What is going on there? Well, from what I've been able to glean it, uh, kind of ended up as well as classic short squeezes for it, or were one thing traders got pot out of sorts with the amount of butter that they have on hand for the amount of bananas that they have and really had to jump in the market based on hey, uh, the butter they needed to have. And now our prices went a lot higher than I believe anybody saw it. Uh, at a time when they typically go higher, but how did they drop back off their place in that area where I thought that they would be uh, back in the middle part of the summers where we're looking at here at the uh, fourth quarter of the year. Carly, I know you focus on Title I of the Farm Bill. We're talking a lot about prices, but when you look at reference prices, we've seen some forecasts out there that say in a new Farm Bill, but raising reference prices, it could cost anywhere from $20 billion to $50 billion. Where are those numbers coming from? So those numbers are based off a straight 
percentage increase across the board for all covered commodities. And that's not exactly what Senator Bozeman is looking at. Senator Bozeman is looking at each covered commodity and taking a more surgical approach. So those scores can fluctuate based on the Congressional Budget Office and what other pieces are in those proposals and other interactions across farm policy. Um, so while those proposals or those numbers are out there, um, we do need a significant investment in the Title I safety net and other aspects of the safety net as well. Um, but those numbers may not be um, a reflection of, of what Senator Bozeman is looking at. But do you expect raising the reference price in Title I, do you expect that to continue to be the biggest sticking point, the biggest hurdle in getting a new farm bill written? Senator Bozeman has been across 18 states, farm bill listening session, and that is the number one ask we hear across all meetings, across all commodities. Um, that we need to update the safety net. It is based on 2012 data. And if we lock producers into another five-year contract of outdated reference prices, that safety net is not going to be a, a, a viable safety net. Thank you all for joining us. We appreciate it. All right, we need to take a quick break and then we'll have much more right here on U.S. Farm Report. The Cotton Harvest Tour on U.S. Farm Report is brought to you by Delta Pine. Dedicated to cotton, committed to you. It's been extremely dry in Tennessee this fall, and that's helped propel the cotton harvest pace across the state. It may be dry today, but Tennessee was home to some of the best crop condition ratings across the country all year. And as we continue our Delta Pine cotton harvest tour, Tennessee just may be the garden spot for growing cotton this year. Walk out in these West Tennessee fields of white cotton, and you'll walk into a snapshot of what 2023 produced. This year, we've got a potential to make a really good cotton crop in, in Tennessee. Brad Williams has farmed for nearly 30 years, and this crop is one to remember. This crop never really struggled at all. It's, it's even on warm, hot days that we've had, it never wilted any. It looked very exceptionally, just kept growing. He says now that pickers are rolling in the field, the crop is night and day from last year. I think we had record 14 days of 100 plus degrees, no rainfall. Cotton was really struggling to, to survive. But this year, the growing season was almost perfect. We just had very ideal growing conditions this year. And uh, I haven't had a year in 28 years, 29 years maybe, now that I have seen uh, a good growing conditions as we had this year. William says they're seeing yields at around 1,300 pounds of lint per acre. Last year, yields were 900 to 950 pounds per acre. And the prime growing conditions this year started at planting. Planting was pretty much on time this year. Very low pest populations in this crop. And we've been able to you know, maintain this crop as a um, pretty much weed free. He says now that harvest is happening, it's been extremely dry, which is good news for the quality of this year's crop. We can make an exceptional crop and a good high quality crop. That's what we need to compete with the other cotton producing countries in the world and, and I think we've got an exceptional sustainable product that's out here. We just need a good dry harvest from here on out. William says cotton isn't just what they grow, it's intertwined in everything they do here. We have a cotton gin and cotton infrastructure in the warehouse and cotton seed operation also. We're kind of more vertical integrated operation and cotton is our, our mainstay. While well, cotton is a staple for their family, it's an industry that continues to weather its own storms. In my career, we, we were around 830 gins nationwide. I think that number's closer to 500 now. As cotton continues to fight for acres in this area, it's a crop that comes with high risks and high rewards. Cotton's a riskier crop to grow. It's an expensive crop to grow. Williams says despite the risks, he's just thankful for such an exceptional crop this year. As he says, growing cotton here is one that's rooted in faith and the drive to persevere. I enjoy everything about it. I enjoy the picking of it, the ginning aspect of it, producing a quality, you know, fiber that, that can be used uh, around the world. It's something just special and unique and, and a blessing to be able to do it. Still to come, we're off to Germany to see one of the largest and leading ag equipment shows in the world to see what's on display. But first, customer support. Well, some of you may have been helping control the deer population the past few weeks. At least that's the case here in Missouri since it's deer hunting season. But what about beaver control? That's customer support this weekend. Well, it's time to talk wildlife control. 
Over the past couple of years, beavers have moved into the creek of our southeastern Indiana farm, which has an area of woods with the creek flowing through it. As a result, we are now experiencing an increased ineffectiveness of the drainage systems in the nearby fields. Are there some strategies to discourage beavers from being residents in this area of our farm? And that's from Wes Shoemaker in Greensburg, Indiana. I am not an outdoor sportsman. I just, I just work there. And so to answer your question, I found good information at the Indiana Department of Natural Resources. Because wildlife regulations vary from state to state, there aren't federal regulations, this will be specifically for Indiana. The website avoided using the word kill and substitute take, but taking apparently includes killing. My understanding is on your property, if beavers are causing damage, you can shoot them. We had a similar problem about 20 years ago and just called in a wildlife control expert and somehow they went away. We didn't ask any questions. I think he trapped them. I also think beavers are a challenge to hunt since they're rarely seen during the day. You can discourage them by wrapping nearby trees with woven wire or you can mix sand with paint and apply to, to the near trees to a height of about four feet. Even after beaver have been removed, you may have a remarkably strong structure in the middle of your creek to remove. This year may be a very good time to tackle the problem as ongoing drought in many areas of Indiana have dried up the streams. By the way, bring an excavator is my advice, not a backup. My backhoe wasn't up to the job. Beavers can build these massive dams because they grow from 30 to 70 pounds and lengths of four feet. There are two sides to the beaver issue. Farmers such as yourself and me whose tile doesn't drain anymore and wildlife advocates who rightly point out beavers create wetlands to help control our ability or to help our ability to control flooding and prevent species de depopulation. Flooding less than one square mile on private property does not require a permit for taking beaver or removing water flow obstructions. Again, I'm just passing along what I thought I read, so please talk to your local conservation officer or contact the Indiana DNR. Thanks, John. Well, a trip around the globe for a peek into the future. That's next. Happening this week, the world's largest ag machinery show in Hanover, Germany, Agritechnica 2023. It's now underway, and that's where we find our very own Clint Griffiths at the show's first gathering since 2019. Time, this is what the world's largest machinery show looks like here on a busy day with somewhere between 400 and 500,000 people attending throughout the entire week. And this is just one building. There's almost 30 across the entire 100 acre campus. From hall to hall, aisle by aisle, new iron is ready to work. A look at the latest combines. This is a completely new combine that takes us up to the next level of harvesting. To residue managers. The rotor itself has an angel of six, six degrees to the ground. Even new high-speed planters. It's pulled off the disc and shot into the furrows. A global marketplace that in the last couple of years has felt its supply chain slip amid pandemic-induced pressures. We learned something during the pandemic, and that was that our, our supply chain is wildly efficient and pretty fragile. Which is changing the way many of the businesses here at Agritechnica manage their inventory. But there's a many evolution that's taking place, and the evolution is, well, we need to keep, from a manufacturing perspective, we need to keep a little inventory here, especially on the critical components that we may have. and. So it's sitting there just in case there's a supplier issue that takes place, we've got this inventory. But having a few more parts on the shelves does have implications and some ripple effects throughout the entire industry. And the tools are everywhere from innovative concepts like the Nexat system. The way it works is we have a carrier vehicle where you put different implements for the different applications. You hang it under the carrier vehicle. It's because you have one machine, one, one time, let's say the motor, the hydraulics, everything, the cabin, um, for the different applications. So each application that you do becomes a self-propelled application. To hybrid tractors, 
powered by diesel with an electric front axle. Advantages with electrification is I have high torque available at low RPM and it's instant. We've also seen in comparison to our own, own standard vehicles in comparison 10 to 15 percent fuel savings but also a lot of time savings because everything reacts faster it goes smoother. From manufacturing to planting to harvest. We were running this machine absolutely up to its maximum with a 15 meter 50 foot header. You were throwing a tray under this machine and there was no losses discernible behind the combine. Losses is lost grain, but it gives you a problem and it's lost money. For crops and for people. The autonomous system allows farmers to take this tractor out to their fields, get on their My Operations app, tell it to go, and then they can go leave and, and do something else. And so what we're hearing from customers is that, you know, whoever was driving that tractor before and doing that tillage, they're able to maybe go do more value added work on the farm somewhere else. As the industry pushes to eliminate the slack, and make each and every turn count. In Hanover, Germany, I'm Clinton Griffiths reporting. Also a special shout out to Farm Journal President Charlene Feek, a nominee for the Agritechnica Women in Ag Award for Agribusiness. Congratulations on that global honor this week. Well, that does it for U.S. Farm Report this weekend. Thanks to the Missouri Governor's Conference on Ag for having us this week. Next weekend, it's one of my favorite shows of the year, Harvest of Thanks, heartfelt stories that will warm your heart as you reflect on the blessings and give gratitude in 2023. You won't want to miss it. Harvest of Thanks next weekend. And we hope you join us as we work to build on our tradition. Have a great weekend, everyone. U.S. Farm Report is produced and distributed by Farm Journal Broadcast.